And uh, what I tried to do is to do, uh, as we did yesterday, start with the, with the conceptual and the practical level of actually visualizing the music and the insects we used in the early session yesterday morning. Then to get the voice of the choir, it makes a significant difference as we learn the term again and what we might end up again yesterday uh, in the voice. Today is probably my most passionate subject. I think I said that yesterday, didn't I? Yeah. Today is my passionate subject, uh, and that's the subject of, uh, of text. And so my job, I hope in this hour, is to uh, inspire you a bit, to remind you a bit, and to talk about and listen to the, the power of language. Um, let's start with John Dunn. Holy Son. Out of my heart, three person God, for you as yet doth not read, shine, and seek to them. That I may rise and stand or throw and bend your vice. Start again. That I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and seek to them. I like a usurp town to another you, labor to admit you, but owe to no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is proved captive, weak and untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved to fame, but am betrothed to your enemy. Take me to you, divorce me, untie me, break that knot again, take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you and thrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chase except you ravish. The metaphysical poets talked in a language that was so sensually personal that God becomes the object of our love affair, that God becomes love itself. And so you hear words like enthrall, ravish, take me to you, <coughs> imprison me, untie me, divorce me. If you read this poem to your choir rehearsal on Wednesday night, mm -hmm. What expressions would you get? <laughs> That's unfair. There would be some that would really be inspired to hear language like that again. I'm not here as a naysayer today. I'm here really as a positive force and an instrument to say that language is 50% of our art, not 10. It is two arts, music and language. Text was created most often before it was ever set to music, and it is in itself a creation. So, in our efforts to get that Sunday morning anthem ready, we know that that can't be a 50-50 split, because our people are dealing with another language, a musical notational language that is much more that used to be much more challenging to them than the, than the language itself. Now, I think they're both equally challenging. Talk to me. What about today works against language like this? The computer. I could have read that poem from memory perfectly, but I thought I may make a mistake, and here I am relying on this, and did a much poorer job if I just put it down and, and, and recited the, the sonnet to you. What else? The expediency of the urgent. Expediency of the urgent, I like that. We want it now. <clears throat> and so that translates to what in our technology? <clears throat> how, how does our technology afford us the now? I mean, have you seen anyone around here with a cell phone? Uh, can we ever get away from the cell phone? Do we want that text message now? My friend, a lawyer, once upon a time had a weekend, but now clients expect 24-7. They think nothing about texting him at midnight on a Saturday night to, keep, to find out what's going on in their case. And on and on it goes with our lives as well. Uh, technology has not made us more efficient. Well, technology, technology has made us more efficient. The lie was that the efficiency was going to give us the luxury of time that we look for. That's the essence, right? Yeah. So, what does that do to us as choral musicians? We're not, we're not instrumental musicians. Some of us may be, but in this context, we are hymn-based, we are choral text-based. 
And we're working with a, with a culture today that in the shortest possible way communicates. I remember years ago when my boys were growing up when email was really just first becoming uh, a thing and one of my sons left an email that he had written to a friend on the computer and I began to read it and I could have read, I could have translated German more easily than I could have understood <laughs> all the abbreviations of things. So I printed it out, got my red pen as I would any doctoral dissertation and I edited his email for him. With, with capital letters for beginning work, well, for complete sentences and all of that. I handed it to him, he was so incredibly appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to take too much time, but I'm saying today, doctoral dissertations, they're, they're, nothing is safe. I spend more time editing and writing today than I do almost any, any academic part of my job because people have lost the, the skill of writing and they've lost the love of language. Two Kairos moments in my life that actually um, made a remarkable difference for me. One was when I fell in love with language. Uh, as a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin, I read, we sang John Corleano's uh, Fern Hill. And in that moment, Dylan Thomas is sitting there. Sorry, Corey Leano setting up Thomas's for him. And in that moment, I fell in love with language. I wasn't a great English student. I didn't necessarily write well. But that somehow changed my whole love of words. Not just the meaning of them, but the, the expression of them, the anatomy of them, the fact that they, they communicate that which is in us that we cannot communicate in any other way, and yet never say enough. The second Kairos moment was when I taught Southern Seminary. Those 15 years with working with a 50, 55 voice choir of graduate masters and doctoral uh, singers and conductors. Amazing musicians. But they gave me permission to go deeper and deeper into the text itself, into the scripture, to unpack, to exegete. It's not the sole privilege of the clergy or the preachers to exegete their sermons. We must exegete our text and unpack them before our choirs. Um, hang on, the saint's off again, and I was going to use it. I know Siri's not available. I don't care for Siri. <coughs> I'm going to learn this before I die, I promise. <laughs> it will not be today. Yeah, I wrote this for a hymn service, but it applies to text in general. Every time we sing a great text, we lodge deeply in the recesses of our mind and heart words of comfort, challenge, or call that spin themselves around the sacred melodies. These words attach themselves to the profound mysteries of our everyday experiences, and thus the word and music become incarnate in the commonalities of our stories. And that's why a melody, perhaps silenced by years of amnesia or neglect, comes singing its way back into our lives. And words, caught somewhere between our busy hearts and numb tongues, find courage to be reborn. Hymns bring that to us. In those times when everything else fails and we need the most secure moment, sometimes a hymn text will come to me that will give me far more comfort than all of the scripture that I've read. Language connects with us when we connect with it. So, now I'm going to go back to the cue. Uh, so what I'd like to do in this 40 minutes is to talk about language from a standpoint of not enunciation, although that's very important. If our congregations don't hear the words, then they can't have any impact. So maybe we just start at the level of diction that is articulation, that is projecting and actually enunciating in a way so that our audience or congregation can hear us. That's one level of diction. But it moves beyond pronunciation and an enunciation 
to an interpretive level of diction that gives language an opportunity to possess innate shape and expression. This attention to the expressivity of language shapes the choral tone, it molds a musical phrase, and it creates an aesthetic union of words and music. So I've got three goals on your handout. I'm, not, I'm just going to keep music up here today. If you have a handout, if you don't, there should be some in the back. Uh, three, three goals today. How to improve the sensitivity of language and ways of comprehending a text, both for our choir as well as the people that we sing it for. Second, how to musically express a text through inflection and pacing. And third stage, how do we mold choral tone and overall expression through the diction by adjusting the consonant articulation and the vowel shape? Um, do you have in your packet uh, the hymn to God the Father? You know, that's the one piece of life. Um, is there an extra packet back there that I have? <coughs> Adam, is there one extra packet that I can share? Um, Does anyone know this or would play it, play a bit of it for us? I know that's spur of the moment, but I just said this one. Anybody that would feel comfortable playing a bit of this hymn to God the Father? Yeah, great, thank you. Come on up. And let's have a good chance to. Jeff. Yeah, good to see you, Jeff. All right, let's check that out. Good. Let's, uh, let's sing him to God the Father. How many of you know this? Great. You just, you're going to learn a new piece. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for this. Uh, and we may not go all the way through. Let's, uh, let's, let's give it a try. Uh, and...
minutes. Thank you so much. Beautiful play. Um, you want a professional anthem? This is great. Somebody tell me what it means. Why is it hard to come up with a quick answer? <laughs> Absolutely. So what I've just demonstrated is what me and most of you do at time to time when we run it on Wednesday night and it's a new piece and we're just scared to death that they're not going to get a hold of it. And we give a downbeat and here we go. Just let's just get through it once and get an idea or whatever. And <coughs> they don't have a clue. You could be singing jingle bells with this thing and they're just trying to hold on to the rhythm and the note and the learning. Anyone. doesn't matter. Not the church or anyone. Amateurs, professionals, we all focus first on the notation because that's the least familiar language to us. But the truth is, the metaphysical poets like John Durham, Dunn, and George Herbert, and Robert Herrick, and people like that, their language is as foreign to us as musical notation. Or may I bring it to contemporary terms as the technology crew was when they were talking to me about this and that. Again, I can understand French better than what they were telling me to do on the computer. It's associations, what, we're, what we are most comfortable with. So, what I would suggest to you in this first stage of sensi sensitivity, sensitizing a, a, a choir to the music, is let's use the senses. Sometimes the text needs to be heard. Sometimes we need to see a text. Sometimes we need to feel a text. In this case, I think that just starting out, it might be good just to have it read as I did to you the matter of my heart. Somebody read the first stanza for us. Could thou forgive that sin where I have begun, which is my sin, though it were done before? Could thou forgive that sin? That's right. That's the end of it. No, keep going. Without <coughs> that sin in which I run, and do still do, though still I do, keep going, keep going. When thou hast done, hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. Okay, great. That's a lot of words, Ben. What's that about? We know it's about sin, right? Okay. Without forgive that sin, where I begun, there's the first confession. Ah, not you. Ah. Which is my sin, but believe me, I'm not the first one that did it. Somebody did it before me. At least I. And a few other millions since then. Wilt thou forgive that sin for which I run and still do run? That's Paul. That's Romans, right? That which I want to do, I do not. And that's which I do, I don't want to do. That's it right there. Though I still do deplore. When thou hast done, thou hast not done. Christ has not forgiven me. I have more than that. Yeah, when thou hast done, thou hast not done. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on, Jesus. Just today, okay? <laughs> Let me confess those. Thou hast not done, for I have. Lord. Somebody read the second verse. Will thou forgive that sin in which I have won others to sin and made my sin their door? Will thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two but wallowed in a score? When thou hast done, thou hast not done. For I have more. Well, now it becomes infective. It's not my sin, but forgive that sin which I want others to sin and make my sin their door. Without forgive that sin that I did shun a year or two, I tried, I tried, but I wallowed in the school of years. When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I, hang on, have more. <laughs> Third stanza. I have a sin of fear, a fear that when I spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. Swear by thyself that at my death thy sun shall shine as he shines now. And here too, 
And having done that, thou hast said, I fear thee. I think, I think I like the metaphysical poets because of their honesty. Not just their passion, but their honesty. Don expresses what all of us do have, but simply do not publicly confess. And that is the fear of death. I have a sin of fear that when I spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. Now the charge, what I committed to you, swear by thyself that at my death, thy sun shall shine as he shines now and heretofore. And having done that, thou hast done. I fear thee. Now, it took about three minutes and we could have done it faster if we wanted to. I know I do not have time in an hour rehearsal on Wednesday night to do something like this. But you do. You can do it in a printed something before the rehearsal starts. You can say, hey, meditate on this before rehearsal begins and then maybe you read it. And so, But I also think there's some power in asking others to read because you pull a choir into that. And remember, we're, we're, we're already sensitized to it. It's not about us. We're trying to bring a group of people in to a language that is as foreign as a notation they're about to see. Sometimes people need to hear the text read. Now, we're going to go to, remember I teach at a state university, so uh, uh, as, uh, as Auden said, holy still a speech. There is no sacred tongue. The truth may be told by all. So you'll be seeing some secular pieces in here, but they still prove, I think, the same points. There are some pieces that we need to see and not just to hear. Any piece that you do that has a story to it, a passion, <coughs> a, a Christmas, any story of Christ, any parable, something like that, we need to bring our singers not just into a language of understanding, but a language visual to be able to see a scene or a story so that it brings it to life. Eric Whitaker, uh, my, one of my favorite pieces and still one of the oldest that he wrote is Leonardo Dreams of His Flying Machine. And in this, uh, Whitaker takes a, a, a vision of Leonardo da Vinci in front of the Brunelleschi Dome in Florence at his apartment window, his sketchbook out, if you've seen the sketches of his flying machines and all, figuring it out, watching birds fly, watching the wingspans, notating the, the, anything that he could about the length, the proportions. And after all of these designs, sketches this machine out, and he dreams of flying, and then as he puts the scientific method together and pulls it all, he creates it, and he leaps out of his window and begins to fly over Florence. That didn't happen, but it was a dream. And so when I worked with my Texas Tech Choir with this, we took this apart just like a movie producer would various scenes. Here's the prologue, here's the beginning. Uh, maybe you fuzzy the edges and you go back in time, whatever. But you begin to paint this as scenes. I'm going to pick you up uh, here. I'll give you the beginning and be patient with me and see if I can kind of keep all of this stuff going. Here is Leonardo. Leonardo is
Now that's a prologue. Now here is the call of the sirens.
basic church choirs that I've had to more advanced church choirs, but it's the repetition of this approach to language, a sensitivity, talking about a color change here will evoke certain changes with certain singers in your choir. Here, the coming steps says, I thank you, God, for most of this amazing day, for the leaping greeny spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural. What words jump out to you in just reading that? That you hear it for the first time. Colors. The colors. We literally have colors. Green, blue. Uh, and so I approach this literally from colors. I gave them four colors. The first one is rainbow. And the beginning of it is just that. Coming through, well, whatever coming steps is painting and opening sunrise. I thank you God for most this amazing day and you feel that opening up of that F9 board that we talked about yesterday into this full sunrise. So I tell them that I want to start very conservative in their tone quality. Round the lips. I thank you. Not I thank you. So Use your lips as embouchure and wrap them around. Start like this. No, I'll keep it in, but anyway, it's my key today. Um, and then as you go, open the vowel up so that you get the full rainbow spectrum of that, of that color. And then I gave them the next one was green for the leaping green, these spirits of trees. Green is an active verb in this case. It is one that has action and liveliness. It sprouts. It is, it is alive. And so change the diction from the more elongated to for the leaping, creepily spirits of trees. Hearing all the plosives and everything that you can get from that. Then, what would you do for blue? It's a question, it's a question not rhetorical. What would you do with that? What would you tell them to do with that color? Warmer. Did, did you ever think that vowels actually have characters? Green! Green! Yeah, so that rounded pure and the blue true, no go, and the blue true dream of, and the blue true dream of skies. Kiss every one of those words and you get a different tone color. Then and everything that is natural, natural color, natural color, prism, all colors but no color, white, just white. And so I take all of the Rocco out to the despair of my voice faculty. Just mention it, three bars and they go nuts. You know? <laughs> just take, take it out for three bars. It won't, it won't change your life, it won't kill your voice. Uh, do it healthily, but just take it off so we hear the overtones of that. I don't know if you'll hear all of this, but let's take a listen and see. This is LSU last year in England for the British Choral Directors Conference.
So yeah, I mean, I think you can hear some of it. Uh, and I think that you can talk about different colors for, for different texts to paint that. It becomes so much more uh, personal to the singer when they feel like that they can engage in a language or in a text through the music itself. So that's metaphor. We have to skip over some of these to make it through if you'll apologize that. But I would like to go for um, stories again. Characters as vehicles for stories. Uh, we do a lot of them in the church. We tell a lot of stories about Jesus, and we have a lot of characters in our uh, in our uh, choral music. And so, paint those characters with a personality that you can hear one from another. One of the greatest challenges I had of that have of that kind of thing is uh, is we did this is Texas Tech again. Uh, we did the national convention in Los Angeles for ACDA, and we. Uh, our closer was uh, a Finnish composer, um, uh, Jaco Mantiarvi, who set one of the Shakespeare, set a whole group of Shakespeare texts, and he set the witch's cauldron scene from Macbeth. And so you have three witches in this, and you have the scene of round and round the cauldron go, and calling forth and, and so forth. And I brought in our theater director to really coach us through. Uh, the, the, I'm not the Shakespeare authority, but to coach us through this, and we tried to create three different characters of the witches. Now, <laughs> you'll hear about 12 different British accents from Cockney to uh, Northumbrian, so I can't say that we were successful in unity, but we gave a bit of color. When you see it, nothing is really written in the score that Matthew Arty does to create these characters, so it's about imagination more than uh, anything else. If you'll see all my scribblings of Adonis and to, um, uh, to some of the words uh, and the assonance, throw, throw, or toad, if you want to try the copy version of that. But here is double, double, toil, and trouble. Second piece was 
Pretty good. The third piece was, and I was asleep in my chair by the third piece. Why? One of the most beautiful voices that knew, understood nothing about language or color. Perfect German, but no expression at all. Just perfect theoretical diction is what I thought. So, we can do the best job we can, which is really hard. You've got the hardest job with just a one or two rehearsals a week to train a choir to do this, but slowly over time, Again, my point is, if this is nothing more than just opening some doors of ideas, because if I can't imagine it, then I can't create it. Um, let's see what I can skip now. Um, I'll skip that. Could we agree that, um, that the stage two, the natural flow of phrase, well, let's just take one example. The Lawrence and Shur on the Shining Night uh, is a good example because the men start on this rather repetitive phrase. <coughs> I keep adding, oh no, I can't decide. Um, back up one to letter D. Psychology of text and its implications on tone. Um, Norman Dinnerstein was uh, dean at CCM. He lived a very short life out of leukemia. This is the only choral piece I know, but he did a setting of when David heard that Absalom was slain. And it is the most powerful setting of this that I know. And we began working on this one. Um, actually, we also took this one to ACD, ABCD uh, this summer. And um, what, I, what I researched about that, not having any classes in psychology, was I went back and reviewed what I remember somebody said about the Kubler-Ross uh, Five Stages of Grief. And as I began to work through this piece, he had perfectly set that text with about five divisions of the grief that David went through. What is the first? The first one is denial, right? And the second stage is anger. And uh, so on and on it goes to get through to the final resignation or acceptance. But this was so challenging for the choir, vocal, but until they understood uh, <coughs> these, and again, you're dealing with college kids. I mean, some have, but most have not gone through the five stages of grief. But those of us that have no suffering and no grief understand that there is a psychological, emotional part of this that, that, that is real. And if you can't build it in, in this one of the probably classic Old Testament texts of, of sorrow and regret with David, here's just a bit of it. Now is the winter of our church's day. May the glory of summer find the sun of the world.
I put these old tab, these old pasties in. That's the wrong word. Posties. <laughs> 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 These are different than post-its, okay? Uh, so, uh, these little post-its, and you see tears at the beginning of grief, emotion, through the call of the vowel. I mean, I have to remind myself of this, but you have to train a choir in ways of, of feeling that. Let's move on to the natural inflection of the phrase. So, uh, the Lawrence and uh, Sure on the Shiny Knife, uh, it, it's... It's repetitive. The beginning of it is sure, all this shining high, all the same note, all the eight note. So we know that we've got to sing this with a sin tax of phrases. Sure, on this shining night, the star made shadows round. But it's not built into the music. So sometimes you actually have to build this in yourself. The panther is 
light of Allah. Except it has to be dark. <laughs> this is this is the Nash. I love it. So, are you going to say the Panther? The Pa. Say that. The Pa. Voice a TH and explode the P. The Pa. Yeah. So what I got them to do is this first one is just explosive consonants. And uh, if you like a panther, and then I'll leave the Indian for you. I'll try to get this off the screen.
We're going to talk about text and we're talking about style and sound. What about the various styles of music, spirituals, for example, and how do we address that style versus uh, a hymn or versus other types of music? Uh, love to have you back for that. And then at 4 o'clock this afternoon, programming. That's a new lecture for me. It's hard to do what on that, but creative programming. Some really practical ideas of processionals, uh, fresh ideas uh, for ways to begin a uh, Christmas program or something like that. And I'll have a display of programs out so you can kind of look over and see some ideas. Thank you very much.